Well, welcome everyone to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm Lori LeBay, the host and founder of Alzheimer Speaks. I'm also the daughter of a mother who had dementia for 30 years. And that's really how I landed in this space, was to try to make a difference and improve other people's lives through the information that I had um, found out along the way and by raising other people's voices. Today, we are lucky to have Dr. Patrick Doyle with us, who is the Director of Dementia Care at Brightview Senior Living, and I'll be introducing him shortly. But before we get started, we're always getting new listeners, so I would just like to give people a little bit of history about who we are and what we do. And bottom line, Alzheimer's Speaks is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort around the world. We're also known as a media outlet for people who want to um, expand their, their marketing plan f- platforms or want to disseminate information regarding um, various uh, forms of dementia and or um, giving care at different levels. We believe here that by sharing knowledge and just having these everyday authentic conversations about dementia is really the only way we're going to remove the stigma and we're going to help people live purpose-filled lives, both those diagnosed and the families supporting them, as well as staff um, that work in that arena. At our core, we also believe that collaboration is the only way we're going to win this battle. And I know that it's working thanks to each and every one of you. You see, your likes, your clicks, your shares of our content have gotten us recognized by Oprah, by Dr. Oz, by Maria Shriver. And I don't say that to pat ourselves on the back because we did not do that ourselves. You guys did that. And so I share those recognitions with all of you. Because every time you share information, just like when we share information, we're pushing it out to people in need. And if they're like most of us, they're not going to grab it till they're really ready. But it makes it easier to grab a hold when it, when it seems to be the norm. And you're just more comfortable with the content. When you, when you see people talking, I don't care if it's about memory cafes or housing or um, di- different types of diagnosis or maybe it's prevention, it's just easier to grab a hold of when you're repeatedly seeing this kind of in, a, in a, almost a soft sell type manner. But, you know, in the last even five years, it's amazing how much more information is out and available, how much we hear on the news. Um, and so that, that generates conversation, and it's a conversation that's long overdue regarding dementia and how we give care. And so you might be our our next guest. All voices are welcome here. So maybe you are diagnosed uh, with a form of dementia. Maybe you're a family or a friend caring for someone with dementia. Maybe you're a business professional like like Dr. Doyle here um, with us today and is going to show uh, showcase some of his talents and his insights that he has learned over the years in terms of how to live well with this disease. Maybe you're an advocate. I mean, we have had singers and songwriters and movie directors. Um, we've had Harvard Research on, on the show. Um, we've had people who are running across America or cooking their way across America to raise funds. There's no right or wrong way to um, become active and become an activist and an advocate for change with that. So again, just go to alzheimerspeaks.com. There's a big contact button up top and, and reach out to me. I'd love to talk with you. I also want to um, just promote a couple of events that I will be at in March. March 6th through the 9th, I'm going to be out in Chesterton, Indiana with the library system there for their community conversations. We're going to be doing screenings of the film, His Neighbor Phil. And so if you're in that area, you know, please come out and visit me. I would love to meet you personally. In um, mid-March, I'm going to be down in Melbourne, Florida the 15th through the 19th for a conference there and it's a uh, it's a family caregiver conference and again you can get more information on alzheimerspeaks.com and then the end of march the 26th through the 28th i'm actually going to be at the northwest rural conference uh, health conference out in spokane washington and i'm really excited about that one because sometimes our 
rural areas get left out and they are very excited about having a conversation about dementia. So that's um, very fun. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention the Memory Cafe directory. For those of you that may have one up and running, make sure that you get listed in there. It's free, or if you're searching to see if there's one in your area, just go to memorycafedirectory.com, and that is produced by Calendar Cards, and they are just wonderful to work with. Also, I learned about a new app just uh, in the last month or so called the Roberto app, and it was actually developed by athletes to check their brain performance. And it's really cool. It's very inexpensive. In fact, you can um, get a free subscription for it for a short period of time using our code again on our, our web page but you just play video games and it will it will monitor the various parts of your brain um, so that you can kind of track how you're doing and keep in mind that every brain function you know if you're not doing so good doesn't mean it's dementia you know maybe you didn't get some sleep maybe, maybe you're stressed out you know maybe you have a vitamin deficiency or are dehydrated there can be all kinds of different things that that come into play there so um, I, I would really encourage you to check it out. It's it's a pretty um, it's a pretty cool app, and they are they're bringing this now into the schools and also into the businesses as a team development piece um, for people just to be more conscious of really their most precious organ they have, the brain, and we we don't really talk about it much. So let's let me introduce our guest today. I am very very excited to have Dr. Patrick Doyle with us. He has his doctor doctorate in gerontology from the University of Maryland in uh, Baltimore County. And he is the director of dementia care at Brightview Senior Living, which um, I was just introduced to them recently when we did our dementia friendly cruise. They were so nice to sponsor Jennifer Fitzpatrick's book um, with us, which was uh, just uh, absolutely fantastic. And people just raved about that. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Doyle. That was wonderful. You um, also are a principal faculty member at the Center of of Innovative Care in Aging at John Hopkins School of Nursing. So that sounds really interesting um, as well. So again, thank you very much for your work in that area. And Patrick has um, designed and implemented and evaluated person-centered dementia care practices in over 35 Brightview senior living communities, while at the same time confronting the realities of dementia within his own family. And so he gets it. <laughs> he totally gets it. So, so welcome, Patrick. And I have to ask you, I should have asked you before, do you want me to refer to you as Dr. Doyle or Patrick? I've been kind of bouncing all over there. Patrick. Patrick. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I always ask our guests, you know, have you been touched? And it's, it's evidence you have been touched. Can you share a little bit of of where you're at in the process and what that felt like to all of a sudden be one of them. <laughs> you know? sure. Yeah, I, I, as you mentioned, I have been personally touched. Uh, my mother lives with dementia. Um, it's one of those circumstances that we're not quite sure uh, what type of dementia it is or what's ultimately causing her cognitive change. Um, but we live with the cognitive change every day, regardless of, of its etiology. Um, so it's been a few years uh, since she was formally diagnosed. Um, she has a more vascular type dementia. Um, she's had health problems for, for a long time now, over a decade. Um, but now it's more cognitive in nature. So we've been, as a family, trying to figure out the best ways to support her at home. She lives at home with my father. Uh, my sister is, I guess, the good child lived right down, two houses down from them whereas I live uh, in Maryland a little further away um, but we're still pretty early on in her journey um, I'm happy to talk about exactly what we're experiencing today um, but you know I, I feel like I've had a more expanded perspective as it relates to dementia care and support um, as you mentioned I've been a, a, a professional for a long time but now uh, my perspective has changed slightly as, as a um, son of someone living with dementia. Yeah, it is, it is interesting. You know, for me, I wasn't a professional in the industry. 
I, I kind of um, grew into that through my experience, but I hear from so many people that have been in the industry for so long how it really takes them back because you know it and again you don't know what you don't know but that real life experience does twist things a little bit in terms of what's practical and you know how often does something really happen and can you really control it and because you have all your dynamics and then the surroundings dynamics and other people i mean all that stuff it 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 changes it up yeah my my mother was the person who introduced me to the field uh, uh -huh. when I was young. Uh, so I, I always saw her as, as the person who was leading me to, to have a, a um, evolved perspective as it relates to care of older adults and people living with dementia. And um, when she started to um, change cognitively, uh, we had to reframe our relationship. Um, and she was always a very independent and strong and driven person, and some of her, her personality has changed, as you would expect as con she's confronting dementia. Um, so I was surprised by how much I became frustrated with that mm -hmm. uh, and would verbally become frustrated. And you know, I, I looked at myself and said, geez, you teach this every day. <laughs> you can stand in front of hundreds of people all the time and you tell them how important it is to be patient and empathetic and, and you know, not to remind someone that they just asked you that question. And yet now I'm struggling as a son because the visceral component of care became that much more relevant. I no longer had the objectivity as a professional, as an educator, um, as a dementia care professional. So it, it changed things for me. Yeah, I, I found the same thing. And, you know, I was always in the kind of the caring profession. I was in the healthcare, and then I went into real estate where you're, you know, caring for families and moves and things. And, and um, my mom would always joke, she's like, she would always say from, from when I was very young, you sure have a lot of patience with everyone else. <laughs> you know, and, then, <laughs> and that, you know, that, continued and though you know you, you work on it and stuff and you think you have a better handle on it and I I found myself getting really frustrated too with with my mom so I ended up creating a tool because I was a I was a taskmaster and I wanted to be in control and in charge and I needed to know that I was doing something right so I love checking off my list you know my brothers later on told me no you're not a taskmaster you're a control freak <laughs> you know so we had two totally different visions of of who i was but i i realized that that was controlling me and i didn't like how i was always responding to mom when she'd repeat herself 45 times in 10 minutes i wasn't the gracious loving daughter that i knew she deserved and so I, I came up with this tool called Your Memory Chip that, that made me stop and think before every interaction. And for me, it was life changing and, and many people use this now, but it, it asked three questions and one was, what do I want her to know? And that was as a daughter that I love her, but it can be used for staff as well, that, you know, that we're here to support you, but realizing that it has to be more than words. You know, we have to use all of our all of our senses to connect because then they're they're more deeply embedded and and help the person remember and the second one was really the most powerful and that was asking myself what do i focus on and i would focus on my tasks you know my little to-do list and that wasn't working so i had to switch that and decide to focus on three simple things was she safe was she happy and was she pain-free and when i focused on those three things I found I didn't have to do all the tasks that I thought I did, or I didn't have to do them in the manner that I did, but it allowed me to reclaim my relationship with my mom and just slow down. And, and then that was my empowerment versus checking it off on the list. And then the last one was um, really being conscious of moments of joy and recording those if it was on my phone or if it was a story or if it was talking with friends but really connecting on a deeper level to share and and i apologize for getting off track but i just thought you know i, I was through it for 30 years and if that can help you or anyone else out there 
because it was life changing for me. It's Just awesome. yeah. Um, so I, I want to know, you know, you said your, your mom kind of introduced you, you know, to dementia. Can you go a little bit deeper on that in terms of, 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 you know, maybe there was a, was there a particular moment in that journey with your mom that you just knew this was the path you were going to go down? I'm happy to talk about it. And, and frankly, I could talk all day about it. So I'll try to be somewhat, <laughs> but, um, when I was, um, only nine years old, uh, my mother made a fairly dramatic career shift. Um, she was a higher level executive at a bank in Rhode Island, and that bank, as typically happens, was bought by another bank, mm -hmm. and she decided that it was not the industry she wanted to be in, and she decided to step away, but she still wanted to find an area that would have growth. So she decided to get her foot in the door with a local nursing home and help as an activities director. Now, as you might imagine, with that transition came probably a fairly significant pay cut. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that now as a father of three kids, daycare <laughs> is a concern. So she said, instead of putting the kids in daycare, what I'm going to do is bring them with me. It happened to be the summer. And she took me and my five-year-old, uh, my five-year-old or sister with mm -hmm. her to the local nursing home. Um, now you can imagine what I was thinking as a nine-year-old. Mm -hmm. Too happy about that. My summer of play outside was was quickly vanishing before my eyes. Um, but you know what we found, what we um, what we experienced was a tremendous amount of joy and happiness. Um, I, I just had so much fun. I developed these close relationships with um, residents who I still talk about today. I know their names. I remember how they behaved, how they acted. And often when I do talks, I'll, I'll talk about them because I think there's a great deal of power in stories. So my mother introduced me to a setting that at first I thought was going to be just this terrible setting. And mm -hmm. on many levels, it was somewhat terrible. I mean, it was a traditional nursing home. It well, was, and back in the day, because, you know, you are no longer nine. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so it's it changed a lot. Day, it was not great. <laughs> Um, but the people were, mm -hmm. the people were, I saw just this purity in, in the residents who just, if I did the right things and we had a good time, there was a great deal of joy and happiness. Now, what I didn't realize at the time was what was wrong with those individuals. Now, I noticed differences, but as a nine-year-old, I was more like, eh, they're, they're fun. They're, they're different than me, but I like them. I like that Gladys walks up and down the hallways and says, oh, blah, 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 to the, to the housekeeper when she's trying to take the linens cart away from her. I loved that. I thought it was rebellious. I thought it was fun. But I didn't know, I mean, only knew in retrospect that, that many of the residents I grew to love in that nursing home had dementia. So I continued to work through um, high school and through college in nursing homes so in various mm -hmm. parts of the state. Um, and one day when I... Um, just one random day in a nursing home, I realized that I, I couldn't do this anymore. I couldn't just sit idly and watch care that was substandard and it needed to be better. So ultimately, my mother motivated me um, to leave Rhode Island, go get my degree in gerontology, and become a person that could influence change in uh, elder care. So I became a professor because that's what every professor tells you in doctoral school and realized that wasn't why I, I went into it. And then I decided um, that I need to go back into practice. And, and that's when I, when I joined Brightview. Right okay. It was her that, that was the impetus to all of this. She started it off. Well, you know, I, I love that story because it just shows too, with kids, we haven't learned that something's wrong. Mm -hmm. We're just accepting of them. And I remember going through that with my own daughter. It was in school. And I remember her, her teacher saying, oh, you know, she's so compassionate. And, you know, she helps this one out and she helps that one out. And, and, and I just looked at the teacher and I said, you really don't get this, do you? And she's like, what? I said, she's not a super duper perfect kid. She just doesn't see what you see. Mm -hmm. She doesn't That's see true. it at all. That's true. You know? One of so from all of this, I, I wanted to share the story. So we, we share the story, my story, 
um, with all of our associates at Brightview, all of our mm-hmm. care partners, um, and the training. So we have the kind of state mandated training that teaches you about dementia, the different types, um, and all of the clinical aspects. But then the training immediately after is titled Forget Dementia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it goes over, you know, if you think like a nine year old, if you almost have a naivete about dementia altogether, and you just focus in on the person, the individual, and build relationships and have authentic partnerships with that person, it's at that point that you can truly provide great dementia care. So we, we kind of use that story to show folks that dementia really isn't the most important thing when we consider how we support and be an ally to those mm-hmm. individuals. I so agree. Even like with the memory cafe concepts, I, you know, tell people, you know, people come together for that group and it's the person with dementia and their care partners. And I, I say, it's kind of like a bowling league or a bridge club. You don't show up for the equipment. You show, you show up for the conversation and the camaraderie and, you know, and, and it'll, it'll creep in and out in different fashions because it's, it's part of the whole, but it's not the whole. You know, and and I I love, uh, I think kids and the intergenerational interaction is so powerful. It's, you know, because everybody is learning. And even when you mentioned, you know, when the gal was given the housekeeping person, you know, you're like, whoa, you know, they're kind of railing it against them. And, you know, it was, it wasn't a negative behavior. It was just a characteristic, you know, it was part of her, her character. And, um, and you applauded, you know, her being able to be different. And we've, we've really, as a society, lost that. And I think that's why we have so many social issues going on right now. We've lost our, our empathy and our, our compassion and our ability to see the brilliance in our differences. Yeah. Instead of being, we've been taught to be scared of them or to shun them or, you know, just fit in the mold and be like everybody else. Well, what, what attracted you specifically to, out of all the senior living communities, what attracted you to Brightview? How'd they win you over? <laughs> well, I, I think that we both won each other over. I, certainly um, a non-traditional uh, marriage. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was uh, academic and not many senior living companies are looking for someone with that sort of background. Um, I was still fairly early in my career, but we both saw a lot of potential in, in that partnership. Um, so when I, I was moving back to Baltimore and I kind of had to hit the, the job market, see what was out there. So I casted a pretty wide net and I saw uh, this company called Brightview Senior Living and a job announcement for corporate director of dementia care. And I started to read um, the job description. And I noticed that that job description was essentially what I was researching. So I saw it as an opportunity to take my research, my, my publications, my presentations, my courses, and, and see, could I actually do it? I mean, mm-hmm. it's very easy to talk about it yep. um, and to write about it, but it's more challenging to put it into practice. Could I truly do what I wanted to accomplish before I went to graduate school, which was change the way things are done. Now, I was, I have an advantage. I happened to come into a company with an extraordinary dedication to person-centered care from the Mm get-go. So their philosophies and goals were already oriented to where I was. So I didn't have to change a culture or approach things differently. What I had to do was take the most cutting edge and innovative aspects of what we're trying to do globally in dementia care and put it into practice in 35 communities. Um, so while I wanted to join a, a senior living company, I also wanted to find an organization that was equally as committed to, to the same goals. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was kind of interviewing them from a culture standpoint too. And um, I was fairly sure right from the beginning and over the past four years working here, in the same capacity, uh, I'm even more convinced that we have something special. 
Wow, that's that's fantastic. I have to. I want to um, pose a question to you because I, I have a I have an issue with this, though it's an industry standard, and mm -hmm. it's just the term person centered care. Um, and I I would love to see, and I would love your input on this because maybe I'm off base, but I would love that to hit the road and people to say relationship based care, because I think that's where that's the sweet spot. You know, it's it's. So funny you bring that up. Just before I joined, oh. <laughs> I was on a on a um, a, a board, uh, the Dementia Action Alliance. Mm -hmm. I, I served in various capacities with them, and, and we're partnering with the Eden Alternative um, to look at practice guidelines, best practices mm -hmm. in the care and support of people living with dementia. And we must have spent an hour going back and forth about person-centered, relationship-centered, authentic partnerships. And all of those terms have validity. And we all agree that regardless of which term you land on, it's mm -hmm. the content and the, the meaning of those terms that is most relevant. So I've always used person-centered because as I was doing research, that was the term. That yep. was the term that we used. All mm -hmm. the, the literature that was out there talked about person-centered. We all talked about Thomas Kitwood and mm -hmm. Dementia considered in his book and you know so my origins of person centered are very much based in the relationships around us mm -hmm. who's person centered to ensure that the individual who is living with dementia is always our primary focus that we continue to see them as a full person mm -hmm. um, we we dispel all of the ideas of the long goodbye of the deselving process of dementia and we focus in on that whole person and we developed relationships, empathetic relationships with those individuals to support them. I have no objection to relationship-based. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that it gets at the most foundational component of dementia care, which is the strength of the bond that you have with the individual. Um, so I'm just using the term more as a holder. I'm not mm -hmm. particularly tied to any one term. I'm more tied to the overall philosophical goals of all of those movements. Yeah, I guess I just see it as a term that has gotten that that had a specialty and has gotten overused and watered down. And yeah. so, to me, it's time to to enter some new terminology just to just to shake things up and mm -hmm. and get things realigned again. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's in fact we don't use person centered care at at Breakview. Mm -hmm. uh, we're more descriptive in, in what we do so mm -hmm. people understand really our philosophies and our practices. We don't, we don't put it under any umbrella mm -hmm. um, and for very intentional reasons. Um, but we had to figure out as Dementia Action Alliance, we had to figure out, well, how are, how are we going to talk about it? How are people mm -hmm. going to know what we're trying to accomplish, what framework we're trying to generate and what change we're trying to influence? So we didn't come to a conclusion quite yet. It's still an ongoing discussion. I didn't know you belong to that. I used to be on one of their um, advisory groups. I, I was a co-chair for, I can't remember, I think it was marketing or something yeah. a few years back and stuff. So, yeah, good good group doing good things. So yeah. that's neat. Did you go to the, the conference in, that they had in Atlanta? I did. It, did you? No, I was speaking someplace else, but it, I heard it was fantastic. It was fantastic. It was really I've never been so emotional at a conference, and it did happen to align um, with some changes with my mother. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was the first conference I had probably ever gone to that was created and driven by people living with dementia. They yep. were on the stage, they were um, giving lectures, they were on town hall panels, they were answering questions, they were being so authentic and provided an expertise that frankly I don't have any no one has aside from people living with dementia I was so rejuvenated by that conference and felt we need to do this more at all mm -hmm. conferences the voice of the person living with dementia individuals living with dementia needs out there needs to be heard and needs to be listened to yeah 
Yeah, I, I so agree. I do the um, dementia chats, which is a video platform like this, where it's all about pushing out their voice and, and raising it. And I'd done it for years, and I ended up switching platforms. And the, the old platform ate all my old ones. So we had to start from scratch. But it was, I wasn't going to be held hostage anymore. <laughs> and, and told them, well, we can do them again. You know, things have changed and people have changed in the group. And but yeah, there's there's so there's there's such a brilliant insight that they bring to the table and why they haven't been asked to the table years ago um, as an outsider looking in who doesn't have a medical background and just a, a daughter wanting answers. It just shocked me because to me that was just kind of common sense. Um, and it was a, a, a big hole. So it's nice to see that that's changing and that People are, um, you know, their conference was super inclusive of people with dementia, but even just our regular conferences are now finally starting to pull people in or have them be part of their boards um, and really have them be part of our, our government process too, which yeah, is great. Slow change. slow change, but it's happening. And yep. It's very exciting to see. Yeah. So um, let's talk about, you know, with some of the things that, you, that you've accomplished with the challenges of dementia. You know, what are some of the twists and turns that you guys have applied at Brightview um, in your living situations to, to help both staff, the person living with dementia and their loved ones? Oh, well, it's a hard question because I don't know where to start. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that we started with the foundation. So we've already talked a little bit about whatever you call it, having a, a, a hyper focus on each individual person, mm -hmm. knowing that care has to be customized and tailored to each person, um, looking at, at them also as a, a unit. So a relationship, their family, having to support family, um, have, making sure that we have all the resources for the entire convoy of individuals. So I mean, a few things that I worked on initially uh, was making sure that we understood what our philosophy was. So we um, created a, a statement called We Believe, um, which encompasses uh, various tenets of uh, the Brightview approach to dementia care. And um, we, it seems silly, it seems small, but we liked it so much we wanted to create a video. Uh, so we created a short video so we could share it in trainings and we could share it with our associates. Um, it's much easier to communicate things in a video than it is in a page. Yeah. Um, so we created a, a minute 45 second video, the We Believe video, and we did it in a Wellspring village. Now that's important, you might be able to understand why, because mm -hmm. all of the residents who are speaking directly to camera are living with dementia in one of our communities. Um, there are all Wellspring village family members who are speaking to these beliefs. There are associates who are speaking to these beliefs and our directors. So. It's an authentic capturing of our philosophy. So we also show that to every new associate and we ask them to really put it into words and what it means to them. We don't want them to memorize it, we just want them to understand the foundation of what we're asking them to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that video was extraordinarily empowering to create. Um, it was very difficult to create, um, but that then laid the foundation on which we could build. We need to make sure that every one of our team members was on the same page about what it means to be a, a associate in dementia care at Brightview. Um, then we build on top of that. So it's my job and responsibility to pay attention to um, our trainings. We have a very extensive training program called Moments of Possibility. Um, we have a lot of components that I won't go over all of them, um, but one key component in uh, that training curriculum is the Virtual Dementia Tour, um, which is an experiential training, it's a very short uh, training, about 15 minutes, that individuals experience what it might be like to live with some aspects of dementia. Mm -hmm. um, now, the most important piece of that is the debrief. So we make sure that what people are taking out of that experience is empathy. That they understand maybe what it might be like to live with a sliver and you know we can't know, mm -hmm. but that simulation is probably the most powerful 15 minutes that our associates experience in training. Mm -hmm. They come out saying, I'm so blown away and so moved by this. 
um, that I'm going to approach things this way. So we mm -hmm. take an experience and come away with concrete ways to change practice in, in their care approach. Um, so that's just one component. There are a lot of them. Um, I spend an enormous amount of time on design and architecture and layout of our communities. Um, something I had to learn when I came here to break mm -hmm. it. Um, took me some time, but I, I feel like that's also a foundational component. Um, obviously, quality of dementia care is driven by the people and the mm -hmm. approach and the relationships, but you have to start off with the design and layout that, that works to support people with cognitive change. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a cookie cutter by any stretch of the imagination, but we have design principles that carry over from community to community. Um, there are an enormous number of things that I could talk about, um, but I just want to share one more. Um, more recently, um, we've come to the realization, and um, this shouldn't be revolutionary, I hope, to most people, <laughs> but we've come to the realization that music is power. It is, it is everything. So we needed to do as much as we possibly could with music. So we have rolled out a program um, called Mind and Music that has um, introduces music into the broader environment, allows people to enjoy it with singing and dancing and group involvement, but it also brings individuals their music when they want it on their own terms. So mm -hmm. every single one of our residents has a playlist generated by Amazon Music and listened to on their own personal devices and headphones. Um, and we rolled this out, this second phase of Mind and Music, about a month ago. And I can't tell you the number of videos I receive from our communities illustrating the power and how that has moved our residents, our families, and associates. It was just so humbling to see the power of something else. Mm -hmm. And so we will take music as far as we can possibly take it because we think that that has a therapeutic impact that is almost unmatched, um, certainly unmatched from any clinical perspective many pharmacological perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I, um, a friend videotaped my mom and there was a, a gal who came with a guitar and saying to her, my mom was in her, what we thought was her end stages, but she had four more years to go. <laughs> you know, she was on hospice and then ended up coming off. And she, you know, she slept most of the time, but, you know, they would sing to her and she would just, she would come alive. You know, and she didn't know all the words, but she knew some of the words and her, her toes would go and her hands would go and she'd get this brilliant smile and this glint in her eyes and was so happy. And then there'd be a pause and she'd go back to sleep, you know, and um, but it's I, and I, I posted them on YouTube and I'll never I'll never forget. And this has happened on more than one occasion. I'm walking into a conference where I'm going to go speak and there's my mom up on the screen someone else is using her as an example and, and you know the one speaker's like oh my gosh is that okay I'm like it, it yes absolutely that's what they're there for and you know the tens of thousands of hits on these things because people can see the difference and not only does it affect them but it affects the whole room Mm -hmm. You know, everybody around them. And, and we all know as individuals that, that music can make us cry, it can make us laugh, it can, it can you know, it's, it's a powerful thing. And it, it hasn't stopped since we were born, you know, and it continues. And that does not go away with dementia. In fact, it's probably even deeper embedded. And it almost seems in some ways to me and I've, I've talked about this with people with dementia that even though they lose some skill sets um, a lot of their sensitivities they feel have raised and are enhanced and music almost seems to be one of those areas that just really is enhanced and is is so powerful and you know like the saying goes if mama's happy they're all happy <laughs> you know so it's not it isn't always just about them it's it's about everyone finding that calm spot you know space yeah that, there was a I mentioned i have three kids so mm -hmm. I go, the movies i go to see are kids movies mm -hmm. so, uh pixar just released a movie called coco uh-huh yeah i haven't seen that one i'll have to bring my grandkids you have to, you mm -hmm. have to. It, um, 
So Up is another great Pixar movie because it represents older adults in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Coco, um, one of the main characters, the, the um, grandmother has dementia. They allude to it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but the whole movie is about the power of music in building um, relationships in continuing cultures and traditions within a family, within society. And at the end, I won't give anything away, but at mm -hmm. the end, it has a beautiful moment where music um, brings the grandmother out of her shell. Um, and she starts to talk about the song, what it means to her, how it relates to her background, how it relates to some memories. And while it may seem on the surface that, oh, well, this is just an animated movie from, mm -hmm. from Disney, this truly happens. It truly mm -hmm. happens. When you find the right song, the way that people respond will just, it changes everybody's mind about the possibilities that exist for everyone, regardless of cognitive or physical. Mm -hmm. I wanted to bring up too, because you had mentioned the dementia, um, the virtual dementia tour, and um, I've, I've gone through it three times. And people go, why did you do it again? And I'm like, because I just want to experience it. And every time I've gone through it, I've experienced something different. The last time I told PK was the most traumatic on my body because I, I went to leave. You know, I did the, you know, the debrief and stuff. And then I, I went up to my room. We were at a conference. So I went to my hotel room. And I, I got back and it was like an hour and a half, two hours later, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I left my purse. I left my purse. <laughs> I, to, I was like, and I was like one of the last ones. So I was hoping to God they were still open. But I was that disoriented, you yeah. know, through the process. And it does, it just, it's a good teacher of what we don't know and, and what they, what they could be observing. Cause we, we are so set that everybody sees and hears everything that we do. And yet you ask any police officer and they will tell you nobody sees or hears anything the same. And, and the dementia tour just really kind of knocks that um, through the park in terms of what you walk away with in terms of being different. I think more than anything, it simulates an emotional reaction to circumstances. I mean, mm -hmm. you certainly can't be sure that it simulates directly the physical or cognitive changes because it's different for every person who's living yep. dementia. But what it does is it creates those visceral reactions and it makes a person understand why someone might be getting so frustrated or why someone may be confused or disoriented or forget her purse. Mm -hmm. It gives you some insight that the environment both your intrinsic situation and your extrinsic situation of the environment drive how you react, how you behave. So yeah. it helps you get the point across that behavior of a person living with dementia is very rarely strictly a consequence of dementia and far more frequently a consequence of multiple factors, including approach, environment, and their own personal circumstances and things that are happening to them because of dementia. Yeah. Now, you know, you had mentioned about um, training staff. Do you do any educational programs for families too? Yes. Yes, we do. So the virtual dementia tour, we often open it up to the community, the broader community, mm -hmm. which includes families, um, some external service providers like rehabs or hospice agencies will come in and do the virtual dementia tour with us. And we just periodically offer it. Um, we actually open up pretty much all of our trainings to people who are interested. I personally go around and do uh, presentations for families. Um, obviously, I can't get to all parts. We have, mm -hmm. we're in eight states and mm -hmm. uh, 35 communities, so I do as much as I can. Um, but from the standpoint of each individual community, we have um, a lot of engagement with the Alzheimer's Association, with memory cafes, and our Wellspring Village directors, who are our leaders in dementia care in our community. They hold support groups, educational series, and family nights at, at each of the communities. So, wonderful, robust um, um, support structure for our families. Yeah, because I, I, I personally, I just believe that that is so important. You know, to have <clears throat> to include everybody because it. I, I've seen it so many times when I go around. Well, the staff have been trained, but the families don't have a clue why you're doing what. And if you don't have that conversation, it it um it causes friction instead of helping. But uh, and I know some companies are worried about having staff and and families together because oh, what might be said. And yet there's so much to be learned from one another, 
you know, it's just so much um, to be learned. I, I think one of the, the biggest things I learned through merging them together is just, you know, as a, as a daughter, I learned why families act the way they do when, I, when it came time to have to place my mom. And even though my mom wanted to move there because my dad ended up being there for his, his uh, brain cancer, um, I, I understood um, from an emotional side, why why families aren't always the most pleasant, why they're always picking and kind of it, what we perceive as nitpicking. And it was so, it's, it's so basic, you know, it's like st or families have limited time. And so they want, <clears throat> they want the environment to be as best as possible. And so they're going to go in looking for problems to fix. And we're only going to find what we're looking for. So they're going to be upset because, you know, there's a Kleenex on the floor and the housekeeper just left the room. But it, and it, it's just, it's kind of crazy. But when you understand that mentality and can switch that, that they have to trust you to know that you are going to do what's best for their loved one so that they cannot look for problems so that they can come and create moments of joy so that they can, you know, have those relationships. And, and part of it is, you know, as you well know, is, is teaching families how to engage because they're fearful too of, I don't know, I don't know what to do. And, and music is a great tool, one of the great tools to be used for that. I, I couldn't agree more. I think the, the more time we can have our care partners or associates interact with families in a positive way, the more that they can have bilateral empathy for each other. Mm -hmm. you know, families can understand the experience of associates and associates can understand where the families are coming from. We spend a lot of time trying to generate that understanding and empathy. And, and um, you know, part of it is consistent assignments. Part of it is ensuring that the same uh, care partners work with the same residents on a consistent basis. So every time the family member comes in, they know when they see that care partner, they've been working with their loved one. Um, mm -hmm. But part of it is them just getting an opportunity to communicate with each other. Yeah. So our, our supports for families are kind of in two categories. We want families to be able to come and learn mm -hmm. you know, outside of visiting their loved one. They can just be there for themselves, you know, have that that um, that need met, and then the other part is they the family nights are more to facilitate ways for them to interact with their loved ones. So as you mm -hmm. mentioned, some families just don't know how to have a great visit. So we will plan the event, we will plan the activity, we'll have all the supplies, and when they come in to break you, they just sit down and have a good time. You know, yeah. maybe sip and paint with their loved ones. Maybe it's uh, putting hanging baskets together for the courtyard outside. You know, whatever it might be. All they have to do is RSVP, say, I'm going to be there, and then we handle the rest. Yeah. I know one of the, the big lessons that, that I learned with my mom was they had a, a spa day where she was, and, and, you know, they did her hair and her makeup, and they had beverages and, and hors d'oeuvres, and music was playing. And, I mean, the list just went on and on and on and on. And... And, and she was, she, I mean, she was like a changed person. When I went to pick her up, she looked like a 15-year-old in love. She was just full of energy and just this bright spirit was just glowing. And um, it, what we found was that as family, it was like, oh, that was really a cool event. And, you know, you can look at it and go, but we can't reproduce that because it's this big event. But what we could do is take pieces of that event and merge that into our family care. And so I never went without having a little, a little bottle of lotion to massage my mom's hand. My daughter never went to visit grandma without her fingernail polish and she would do grandma's nails. And my brothers, you know, they weren't as touchy feely so they could push the button to play the music. You know, but it but it could be those little moments of joy that didn't have to be really big things, and you don't have to say a lot. Um, and getting people to understand that, you know, sometimes it's just really comforting to be in someone's presence with no words ever being said. You're just comfortable, and that that's okay. You don't have to be doing something. Um, Harry Urban, who is one of my um, men on dementia chats living with the disease, one of his, one of 
his lines that's my favorite is he says i like to relax before i had dementia i still do you do not have to keep me busy all the time but i think it's a mentality with um with family and with some staff that that has to be the mode it has to be in motion all the time and, and the body does need to rest and likes to rest and so it's uh it's interesting all the variables that are that are out there um if we just talk about them you know if we just share you know what's working is there one thing patrick that that you think could be changed to make society a better place for people living with dementia wow so if i could just go like this right yep get that um, wand, <laughs> the wand of, oof. Um, I, I think we've already said it a few times throughout our conversation uh, to me it's always boiling down to empathy mm -hmm. um, to get empathy you, you need a lot of things it's very complex but uh, to get empathy first you need to have an understanding of you know where the other person's at and what they're experiencing but then you need to translate that understanding it, it, into the relationship you need to to, to take that kind of I, I don't know if you've ever seen um, Brene Brown but she mm -hmm. has an amazing short clip on empathy in fact it's one that we show in the virtual dementia tour key brief mm -hmm. because it summarizes that empathy is about knowing where the person's at and taking it in and responding accordingly mm -hmm. show them that you're there for them out qualifications you're here for them whatever they need you're here to support them so and that's not just important from a bright view standpoint i think from a societal standpoint people need to understand dementia more not to be afraid of it and know mm -hmm. that they can play a huge role in changing the lives of every person with dementia in their community um so if i could just hit the wand and just be there it would be to accomplish a deeper sense of empathy toward folks living with dementia yeah. Well, and one of the things that I, I've learned with dementia is that everything that's good for dementia is really good for every other part of your life. So you're not going to learn something that's going to waste your time. You know, it's, it, it, it applies all over. And um, again, you know, my mom had it for 30 years and I tell people her disease is the biggest gift I'll ever receive in my life because so many beautiful life lessons she taught me about being more present and how to do that and um it, it was just an incredible journey and i still feel very connected to her and she'll be gone now four years tomorrow mm -hmm. and i just i can't thank her enough for what she taught me you know during that but you also have to be open to learning you know and again it, it gets down to i think some of the terms we even use with that caregiver you know basically states that we're giving it all away versus care partner care companion where we're more relationship based and it allows us to give and receive instead of just be focused on those those to-do lists well this has just been a great conversation and I, I so appreciate your time and the work that you are doing um i have one last question for you and is are you guys involved with any dementia like friendly movements in in the community itself yeah we have, throughout our, our our company there are a few super involved communities. Mm -hmm. well, one example um uh, dementia friendly Bill Ricca, which is in Bill Ricca, Massachusetts. They're one very um, active community and our, our Wellspring Village director is, is one of the, the leaders in that movement. Um, so they donate books to the library, they help train the first responders about dementia, they're out in the community, they're on you know, public television talking about dementia. Um, so we have uh, really encouraged our communities to get involved in the broader community. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, Dementia Friendly America is, is a um, societal movement, but it's also very, very locally based. So mm -hmm. um, as a company, we strongly encourage that sort of advocacy and education um, from our Wellspring Village directors out to the community. Well, that's great. I know I've been involved with um, several dementia friendly um, initiatives and was lucky enough to be involved with the first one in Wisconsin in Watertown, 
which was uh, just grassroots. And now I'm, I'm working with, uh, I still am very active with Roseville, Minnesota. And they've just accomplished just things that people have told us over and over you can't do, you know, and they have the full support of the city. The city's actually dedicated um, internet space for them on their official website, um, the school district and the library system. And those three are just powerhouses. And uh, you know, I've done some videos. If it will, if it will help anybody listening, if they want to get um, involved in any of that, just what the different departments from fire and police and the library and the school system and and the um, city manager, what they get out of it, and how it's affected um, their work environment, their relationships, and and yet they all say it the way we've done this doesn't drain them, doesn't take a lot of time or energy. It's just really a natural, a natural fit. And, um, but when you get people with passion, you know, on the same page, it, it, it energizes quick and the train, the train just takes out of the station. So good for you guys. It's, um, it's nice to hear uh, a company that's as progressive as Brightview and, um, and really, hands-on with with shaping the future of dementia so thank you so much for for all you guys are doing and um, again thank you for donating the books for our for our dementia friendly cruise really appreciate that now if people want to get a hold of you um, Patrick what's the best way for them to do that well they can certainly find me on our website brightviewseniorliving.com um, but you can always email me, personal email, uh, P as in Patrick, Doyle, D-O-Y-L-E, at dvsl.net. Um, you know, I, through engagement with my, my talks, through education that I do, I, I have a distinct privilege of meeting just an array of individuals um, who are grappling with dementia in many different ways. And I find it very rewarding to give back and to have conversations like we're having today um, with individuals. Um, so anyone who wants to contact me and have a conversation, even if it's not about Brightview at all, I hope that you can tell that this is a passion of mine. It is personal to me, um, and I want to help in any way that I can. And I am so grateful for you, Lori, and for the opportunity to be on your show today and to talk a little bit about Brightview, but also a little bit about my personal story. I probably don't get enough opportunity to get that out there and to talk about it, so I'm very grateful. Uh, for, for you and all of your listeners. Great. Well, thank you again so much for all you're doing. And wrapping up here, I'm just going to do a shout out to a couple of organizations, the um, Women's Alzheimer's Movement, which is Maria Schreiber's. Um, they are just a fantastic group known as WAM. And they will be um, doing their Move for Minds event this uh, summer in June. That, I think they're going to roll information out uh, late March in terms of where all that's going to be. Last year, we were involved in um, six, six different cities, and I know it's going to be extensively bigger than that, and I believe it's going to be bouncing over into the UK as well. And so that's, that's exciting to hear. And, you know, Maria is just probably one of the most authentic people you could ever meet, and I always give a plug to her Sunday paper that she puts out. If you want to get inspired and um, hear her interviews both in in writing and um, she does video ones with thought leaders that is that is the uh, newsletter to get I, I look forward to it every single Sunday morning and then she also shares um, her authentic self and is just so open and so vulnerable um, it, which is I think just great you know she just really calls things the way she she sees them the call alert center I want to um, just let people know about that it, that is a wonderful organization if you are worried about anybody wandering um, it's very economical it's under like $15 a year but you can be all set up in case that would happen it just kind of lets you sleep if you're a business professional and have clients or if it's a family member just to have that set up in place so you're not trying to remember how tall are they and how much do they weigh and, you know what was you know what's the um, license plate number and what they do is they work with the police and they will and you 
you and they will blast that out through the phone system and then have a flyer that you can push out as well. So it's just a, a nice prevention. And, and one of the things that in talking with people with dementia is they say it gives them peace of mind knowing that that's in place too, that it's not kind of the, the elephant in the room that no one's talking about or addressing. It's just, you know, because nobody knows when somebody might walk off and wander until it's too late. Um, we had a woman in our um, memory cafe whose husband had stopped driving willingly over five years earlier, and one morning he took the car. And he was gone for almost eight hours, and the nice construction guys on the road filled his tank because he ran out of gas, <laughs> and they put him back on the road. And then he ended up going the wrong way on a freeway. And again, he got caught um, and stopped, and so there was no damage done. But how scary. You know, you just, you absolutely don't know. And the last one I want to give a shout out uh, to is the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. I just adore them. They just do a lot of holistic things. So if you're looking at nutrition and if you're looking at exercise and meditation, and they also um, work with integrative medicine and research and, and do a lot of um, education and memory screenings themselves, but just a, a wonderful, wonderful organization. So until next time, you know, have a blessed week. And again, thanks for listening and um, please share this with others. We want to raise everyone's voice. And remember, you could be next. Bye now. <laughs>